In this video, we're going to talk about how to do an acid-base extraction. Before watching this video, it's strongly recommended that you watch the video on how to do a simple extraction and use a separatory funnel. So we're going to talk about how to separate organic compounds using liquid-liquid extraction by modification of protonation states of different chemicals. The key concepts that we'll cover include how to do an acid-base abstraction. Once that acid-base extraction is done, how to obtain pure material from an organic layer and how to obtain pure material from an aqueous layer. Also included as key son concepts will be drying of organic layers and rotary evaporation. Before we dig into the details of how to do an extraction with an example, we need to talk about pKa values and how to determine whether a specific species is protonated or deprotonated under a given set of conditions. To do that, we're going to use pKa values to calculate equilibrium constants. So let's say we had this specific reaction illustrated here. The first challenge is this is not drawn out as a balanced chemical equation. And what's really happening is if we think about what's on the left-hand side of the equation and what's on the right-hand side of the equation is that we have the following. Now, if we take out the counterions and just represent those as charged species, we would get to the following chemical expression. And it's easiest when using pKa values just to ignore the counterions and just consider the cations and anions that are involved. So in this specific case, we're going to ignore the sodium. Now, for the chemical expression that I show here, the equilibrium constant would be governed by this expression here, where we have products, so phenoxide and methanol. Phenoxide and methanol are the products, they're on the top, over the reactants, which are phenol and methoxide. Phenol and methoxide. Now, in trying to figure out whether this protonation will or will not occur, the typical rule of thumb is that the conjugate base of a substance with a higher pKa will deprotonate anything with a lower pKa. So in this instance, the conjugate base of uh, sodium methoxide would be, or the conjugate base of methanol would be sodium methoxide. Methanol has a pKa of about 15 to 16, and it will deprotonate anything that has a lower pKa. So sodium methoxide will deprotonate anything with a lower pKa and phenol has a lower pKa of around 10. But that rule can be hard to remember, whereas the equilibrium constants that I'm going to show you how to calculate can always be derived from very basic expressions and first principles. So one can calculate these equilibrium values from pKa values. That means we need to know some pKa values or to have a chart handy. With respect to extractions, uh, things that we often use in extraction are acids like hydrochloric acid and acetic acid, so these two here. Conjugate bases, which we frequently use, are things like sodium bicarbonate. So for that, we need to know the pKa of carbonic acid. Other bases that we use are things like ammonia, in which case we need to know the pKa of the conjugate acid. And another base we might use is either hydroxide or methoxide. So it's useful to know the pKa's of their conjugate acids shown here. So these are the aqueous layers that are commonly used in extraction, either hydrochloric acid aqueous layer, an acetic acid aqueous layer, an ammonium aqueous layer, uh, a sodium hydroxide aqueous layer. So it's good to know these values when thinking about 
determining equilibria in acid-base extractions. Another good one to know is also that for sodium carbonate. So if we have the dianion of carbonic acid, we would use this pKa. Some compounds have two pKa's, so you need to be careful that you're using the correct one. For sodium bicarbonate, we would use this pKa, so bicarbonate being protonated. And for sodium carbonate, we would use this pKa value, so carbonate anion going to bicarbonate anion. Once again, does this particular reaction occur? So we're after this equilibrium constant is defined by this expression here. So the two particular half reactions are deprotonation of phenol to give phenoxide in H plus and deprotonation of methanol to give methoxide in H plus. The two relevant pKa values are shown here. And recall, a pKa value applies to an expression where the protonated form is always on the left. So here's the protonated form, there's the deprotonated form. The pKa is the minus the log of the Ka, so one can interconvert between pKa and acid equilibrium constant values. And remember, those are equal to the products, so phenoxide times hydro hydronium divided by phenol. So if we do that, that means the Ka for this expression is products over reactants as shown. And for this expression, we can go similarly, products over reactions as shown. So we know these Ka expressions and we know the Ka values. So now we look at these expressions and we ask, how are they similar to this expression? And here you see phenoxide on the top and phenol on the bottom, which looks a lot like this, phenoxide on the top, phenol on the bottom. So let's write that down. Now for the second part of this equation, we have methanol on top and methoxide on the bottom. Well, here we have methoxide on the top and methanol at the bottom, so we need to flip this equation over. And if you do that, you get to this. Now, here the H pluses will cancel out. So since that term cancels, we are now left, once we cancel those terms out, with an expression that is equivalent to that of the equilibrium constant. So this equation is the same as this equation up top here. Furthermore, we know this left half of the equation is equal to the Ka of the phenol. And the right half here is the inverse of the Ka for methanol. So one over the Ka of methanol. We know those two values, so we can plug them into this equation like this. And then if you solve it, you get that the equilibrium constant for this particular chemical reaction is 10 to the 6. What does that mean? That means it's a highly favorable reaction. The equilibrium lies far to the right. In other words, if I take a solution of phenol and I treat it with a solution of sodium methoxide, I will quantitatively deprotonate the phenol to give the phenoxide anion and methanol as a byproduct. And these are the sorts of calculations you need to be able to do in order to understand how acid-base extraction works. So let's go through an example. I have three compounds that I've mixed together in a vial and given to a student. And now the challenge is to separate these three compounds. We have benzoic acid with a pKa of 4.2. We have naphthalene, which has no acidic functional groups. And we have naphthal with a pKa of 9.5. In the forms illustrated here, these are all soluble in organic solvents. In particular, these will all dissolve in diethyl ether. So we can't separate them on that basis. However, if we were to make salts of some of these compounds that can be deprotonated, those salts would now be selectively soluble in water. Okay, so if I were to throw in a strong base, I could deprotonate both the benzoic acid and the naphthol, and they would both go into an aqueous layer, but that doesn't really solve my problem. I haven't separated all three compounds. I've managed to separate these two into one flask and this into a second flask. So I have my naphthalene pure, but how do I go about separating the other two? Well, we need to think about their pKa values. So here we have benzoic acid, which has a pKa of 4.2. If we treat that with bicarbonate, we can deprotonate that. This deprotonated benzoic acid anion is soluble in water. If we treat naphthal with hydroxide, we will now get 
this net oxide anion, which is also soluble in water. You see, we have two different bases here. Why did we do that? Well, let's walk through the various equilibrium constants for treating each of these species with different bases. So if we go with the benzoic acid first, and we treat it with bicarbonate or water, and using the pKa values of these, and the pKa value of the benzoic acid is approximately um, four. And if you do that, you can now get, it's about 4.2, I believe is the value we're using. If you use that value, you now get an equilibrium constant for this expression of being 10 to the 2.1. So that's roughly around 100, so that's favorable. And then you get a very large equilibrium constant, 10 to 11.5, so this lies far to the right if we were to use hydroxide. What does this mean? This means that if I treat an organic solution of benzoic acid with either sodium bicarbonate or sodium hydroxide, I will deprotonate it, and the benzoic acid will move from the organic layer into the aqueous layer. Okay, that's interesting. Let's look at what happens when we work with NACFOL. Oh, one other point, uh, it's important that this equilibrium be fairly favorable to get a good deprotonation. Typically 10 to the second is sufficient, but you can get away with even equilibrium constants as low as one. And you might say, well, how is that possible? That means half the material will be protonated and half the material will be deprotonated. Well, as chemists, we can play with a quantity of materials. So let's say we have one equivalent of benzoic acid. We can throw in thousands of an equivalent of the bicarbonate and push the equilibrium to the right. So, so long as the equilibrium constant is slightly favorable, you can induce a deprotonation by adjusting the equivalents of base that are used. So now let's look at NACFOL. And if we treat it with bicarbonate or hydroxide and we use all the relevant pKa values, we can calculate these equilibrium constants using that same method I showed before. And we find out that sodium bicarbonate will not deprotonate naphthol, but, it will de but hydroxide will deprotonate naphthol. So now we have a differentiation. And you can imagine that if we have a mixture of benzoic acid and naphthol, and we can treat it with the sodium bicarbonate, we will only deprotonate the benzoic acid to make the benzoate anion. The naphthol will remain untouched. The naphthol will remain in the organic layer and the benzoate anion would move to the aqueous layer. So this is how we can separate three different components. So we can have these selective deprotonations. With this base, we will deprotonate this one. With this base, we need to go with a more powerful base. We can deprotonate the naphthalene. And then we have the naphthalene, and that will not go into the aqueous layer because it contains no groups that can either be protonated or deprotonated. You can't get an anion easily out of naphthalene. Now, once we've done our separation, we'll have one uh, aqueous solution containing benzoic acid anion, an organic solution containing naphthalene, and one aqueous solution containing the anion of naphthalene. However, we want each of these materials in their pure neutral forms. So what we'll do is we'll take this basic solution of benzoic acid and we'll neutralize it. We'll add acid until it's neutral. And that benzoic acid is no longer soluble in the water. We can either remove that benzoic acid by precipitation, or we could extract that benzoic acid back into an ether layer if we wished. Similarly, we can take the naphtha oxide anion and protonate it to give naphthol, which is no longer soluble in water. It can either be removed by precipitation or extraction with more diethyl ether. Now we have to be careful during these neutralization steps because when you mix bicarbonate and acid, your byproduct is carbon dioxide. So this is going to bubble. And if you add the bicarbonate and the, to the acid too fast, it's going to bubble a lot and it might foam over and out of whatever flask you're using. So you want to add the acid dropwise to your basic solution. Stir a little bit, wait till the foaming subsides or the bubbling subsides and then stir a little bit more. Now for hydroxide, when you neutralize it with acid, you don't have any carbon dioxide being released. It's not how that base works, but it is a very exothermic process. 
So when we neutralize a solution of hydroxide with acid, what we'll do is we'll put this flask in an ice bath and we'll slowly drip in the, the acid and swirl it to make sure it doesn't get too hot. If it gets too hot, it could either explode or boil over. And we don't want either of those to happen. All right, now the result of an extraction is to get a desired compound and only our desired compound dissolved into an organic solvent or separated. So here is a flow chart of how we could accomplish the separation of benzoic acid, naphthalene, and 2-naphthal. We have the mixture of all three. We dissolve them in diethyl ether and we add sodium bicarbonate. Remember the sodium bicarbonate will only deprotonate the benzoic acid. That benzoic acid anion will then move into the aqueous layer with the sodium bicarbonate and the other two compounds will remain in the ether layer. We can now take these two compounds they're still in ether and we can add an aqueous solution of sodium hydroxide. This will only deprotonate the naphthol. So we'll get naphthoxide anion, which will now move into the aqueous layer and we'll get naphthalene, which will stay in the diethyl ether layer. At this juncture, we have several ways we could go in purifying and separating the remaining compounds. One thing we could do is we could take the aqueous solution of the naphthoxide anion, and we could make it acidic with HCl. Remember, this will evolve heat. The aqueous layer would now contain sodium chloride. The neutral naphthol is not soluble in water, and it will precipitate out, and then you could filter it away and collect it as a solid. You could do the similar thing for benzoic acid anion. You make it acidic with hydrochloric acid. Recall, carbon dioxide will be evolved, so you want to do that carefully. Once this is neutralized to give the neutral benzoic acid, it will no longer be soluble in water, so it will precipitate out. And then the aqueous layer will only contain sodium chloride. So at the end of the day, we'll have a solid number one here. We'll have an ether solution of naphthalene, and we'll have solid number two. To complete the exercise, what we would do then is after these solids precipitate, we would collect them by filtering with a Buchner funnel, and then they could be recrystallized from an appropriate solvent to purify them. Now, the naphthalene is a little more difficult because this is still in diethyl ether, so we need to remove the diethyl ether. And another thing is that there'll be a little bit of water still in that ether layer. So water is slightly soluble with diethyl ether. So how do we remove that water? What we're going to do is we're going to dry it using an agent called sodium sulfate. We'll filter that solid away using a gravity um, filtration. And then we'll remove the solvent by rotary evaporation. At that juncture, you can crystallize if desired to purify even fear further. So let's talk about the drying and the rotary evaporation. So how does sodium sulfate works? Well, it turns out that sodium sulfate is not the most stable form of that particular salt and that when it's open to air or treated with water, it will hydrate to give a thermodynamically more stable form that contains several waters coordinated into the sulfate and sodium framework. This is a very favorable reaction. If you were to drop water into sodium sulfate, you can see it immediately clump up, and that is it forming that more um, insoluble sodium sulfate hydrated salt. So this is a way to chemically remove water from an organic solution. Once we've done that, what we'll do is we'll uh, remove the hydrated sodium sulfate by filtering through filter paper with a gravity filtration. This will now leave our ether solution just containing the naphthalene and no water. The next step is how do we get rid of the ether? To do that, we're going to use something called a rotary evaporator. This is basically a removal of solvent at low pressure. We could just boil the ether off, but there are several hazards associated with that. You don't want to put ether on a hot plate because a hot plate is a spark source and ether vapors are extremely flammable. So this is a far safer protocol. And what we do is we take the advantage of the fact that at lower pressures, solvents boil at lower temperatures. So let's say we had something like water, which has a boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius at regular atmospheric pressure. If we brought it down to 40 millimeters of mercury, which is roughly the pressure exerted by a vacuum cleaner, it's not a very strong negative pressure. 
or not a very strong vacuum. The boiling point will lower to down to 40 degrees. And so now it's very easy to remove a solvent at a low temperature. Now, when we do this, we use something called a rotary evaporation apparatus, which allows the uh, solvent to be stirred while this is happening. Because you can imagine if you have a very volatile organic solvent and you apply a vacuum on it, it's going to bubble very quickly as it starts evaporating. And we call that bubbling bumping. And if it bubbles out of the flask or bumps out of the flask, then you lose material because that will also force the solid to go along with it. So we use this apparatus here, which is called a rotary evaporator. So the basic idea is we have our ether solution containing naphthalene in this flask here, which we attach with a clip to this tube that runs through this machine that has a motor that allows this flask to rotate around this axis here. So it'll spin. So this flask is spinning around this axis in the warm water bath. So as the diethyl ether evaporates, the flask gets colder. And so you need to keep it warm with a, a warm water bath. And the solvent will evaporate out of this flask. It'll go through this tube. Here's where we're applying the vacuum. So that's the lower pressure. It'll keep moving up. It'll hit a condenser, which has cold water running through it. The ether will condense and it'll drip back into this receiver flask. And so at the end of the day, what we'll have is a receiver flask full of ether and our original flask or evaporation flask just filled with our naphthalene. Here's a picture of the rotary evaporator that's typically used in the organic chemistry laboratory. And you can see the hot water bath. There's a control here, knob here where we can increase or decrease the temperature of that bath. This knob controls the rate of spinning of this flask around this axis here. And the rate would be illustrated here. And then this knob controls uh, the vacuum. Now, when removing naphthalene on a rotary evaporator, you don't want to use too much heat because naphthalene will also sublime when heated. And this is another reason why we couldn't just boil off the ether because we would sublime away the naphthalene. So the take home message is that solubility can be modified by changing protonation state. Neutral species are usually soluble in organic solvents, but charged species are usually soluble in water. With a knowledge of pKa, we can get selective control over protonation states. There are some limitations. You cannot separate materials that have very similar pKa values. You'd like a gap of around four to five units to be able to get a selective deprotonation. So here are some examples, and you can go through and ask yourself, can you separate these pairs by an acid-base extraction? What you're looking for is there to be different pKa values between the protonation states. So here, the difference in pKa values is about five, and as we showed you, you can separate these two sorts of materials with an acid-base extraction. These two compounds have a very similar pKa, and it's just not possible to get a sufficient degree of differentiation during a deprotonation event. Remember, these are all under equilibrium control. Now here we have a difference of about four or 0.5 pK units between these two phenols. That again is too small, so you wouldn't be able to separate those by an acid base extraction. Now these two species also have similar pK values, but there's a little catch here. This is the protonated form. So the pKa going from protonated to deprotonated is 4.6. Here, the pKa of going from protonated to deprotonated and anion is 4.2. So if you were to treat these two species with acetic acid, this one would be protonated and soluble in the aqueous layer because it's got a charge. This one would be protonated and neutral and would be soluble in an organic layer. So you can separate these two by extraction. What about these two over here? Here, the difference in pKa is only 0.4 units. That's too close. You cannot separate those by acid-base extraction. Here, we have two different kinds of amines. This one has a pKa of 9.4, going from protonated to neutral. And this one has a pKa of 4.6, going from protonated to neutral. That's a big enough difference that we can separate those by acid-base extraction. Now here's another type of experiment one could consider undertaking 
using acid-base extraction chemistry. So you could try and separate these different dyes using acid-base extraction chemistry. And to do that, we need to inventory the pKa values of these different uh, molecules. And when you do that, you see that we have some carboxylic acids. Those will have pKa's in the protonated form of around four. We have some phenols. When protonated, those will have pKa's around 10. We have some sulfonic acids. When protonated, those will have pKa's around minus three. So those are very acidic species. Recall, uh, if we're using sodium bicarbonate, the pKa that we need to keep in mind is six. And if we're using acetic acid, the pKa we need to keep in mind is five. What this means is that if I were to throw acetic acid into a solution of this acid brilliant yellow, it would protonate the carboxylic acid and the phenol fairly well. And the same thing would happen with the red dye number three. We would protonate both of those. On the other hand, if we look at these ones down here, which have sulfonic acid anions, if we throw acetic acid into here, that's not a strong enough acid to protonate this. So this will still remain deprotonated. So that means that if we had a mixture of say red dye number three and this brilliant blue dye, when we add acid, this material will go into an organic layer because it'll be neutralized. On the other hand, this material will remain deprotonated and would stay in an aqueous layer. If we had a mixture of blue dye number one and red dye number 40, we would not be able to separate those because when we add acetic acid, they would still both stay in the aqueous layer. And there is no real good way to separate those two materials because they have functional groups with similar pKa values. So here's an experiment that one could imagine doing, and you can do this at home. You don't need to be in an organic chemistry lab to do this. Let's say I gave you two different dyes, red dye number three and red dye number 40. And the question is, which one's which? Or I gave you one food coloring and I asked you to determine which dye is in that food coloring. If you're to run this experiment where you take the red dye and you add water, the dye will dissolve in the water. You then add vegetable oil, that's our organic solvent. You could also use mineral oil here, which is what's uh, found in baby oil. So any clear baby oil, even if scented, would, would do this experiment as well. What you'll see now is that the uh, red color will stay in the aqueous layer because it's still deprotonated. If we add acetic acid, that will protonate all our weak acids, and the red dye will move into the organic layer. Now there's one trick here that I forgot to mention. When red dye number three and acid yellow are protonated, they lose their color. So what would happen if you had red dye number three here, you had the vegetable oil and the acetic acid, the red dye would move into the organic layer, but you would no longer see a color. So you wouldn't be able to tell if it were in the aqueous layer or the organic layer just by color. You separate those, you take your aqueous portion and you add bicarbs so that you redeprotonate everything. And you can ask what color you would see. And now you take your organic portion, which is going to be colorless no matter what. Uh, and if you add bicarbonate and it turns red, you'll know that you had red dye number three. You could also use this sort of experiment to assess two different food colorings. So if you had a blue food coloring, which had mainly blue dye number one in it and just a tiny bit of red dye number three versus a violet food coloring, which had a lot of blue dye number one and a lot of blue dye number three, you could tell those apart by looking at the colors that were finally obtained uh, from the organic layer upon neutralization. So a really nice experiment to do at home to test the concepts of acid-base extraction.